podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode, and um, following on from the last episode, this week in The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, we're going to be looking at techniques within the therapy room. Sounds, sounds a bit strange, that. I know we use techniques, but it sounds a bit analytical or something. But we're going to be looking at two chair work amongst others. Yeah, now t- it's interesting what, where you started with this, which is the word techniques, because with the move to so-called relational psychotherapy, then some people would, like you have started this podcast with, find the word techniques as not fitting into in inverted commas, relational psychotherapy. Mm. So it's a good way to start what you've just said. Now, you don't have to use the word techniques. Uh, you could say tools in your tool bag. But I'm OK with techniques as long as we have another sentence. Techniques that come from the relationship between the therapist and the client and are to serve the best interests of the client. Yeah. But they come from the relationship. Yeah, I like that. So you'll use, the, we'll call it technique at the moment, or, or, or whatever in your toolbox, from the relationship, not forced it onto the relationship. Yeah, yeah. That's a big difference. Or done at a certain time down the line. Yeah, There's a yeah, but it, it, yeah it comes from the therapeutic work. It comes from the relationship. It's contractual, it's yeah. agreed upon, and it's part of the work towards the therapeutic outcome. It's not yes. like foisted on uh, by the therapist. <clears throat> Which yeah. are probably some people listen to this podcast might think about techniques in that way. I don't. I think of it in terms of what I've just said, it comes out of the relationship. Yeah, but I think it's a really important point to make. It's not kind of like we're on week six, so in week six we do these techniques. There's there's not that sort of a process to it. No, not at all. And uh, in fact, it's the opposite, really. I think that you need to get to know the client first. You need to get to know their story. You need to find out uh, all about the person uh, before you start thinking of so-called techniques to help um, further the process. You need to know the person first yeah. That's the most important thing. And, you know, following on from a lot of the previous <clears throat> podcasts that we've got, if we're talking about imposter syndrome and the survival mechanism that, and everything, it takes a long time to get to know the person sometimes because there's so many guards up and barriers up and things like that. When you were talking then, I was thinking, I know that sometimes people are quite critical of therapy taking as long as it does, you know, CBT and, you know, six or eight week courses that people go on. You know, I often get asked the question, why does it take so long in therapy? And I think you've just said it there. (laughs) Yeah. And I think you can do brief psychotherapy. Well, I think actually, I think that's a nonsense term. It's a paradoxical use of terms but I'll use it anyway because I've got a very good book I like which is uh, by a friend of mine who edited a book on TA and by brief psychotherapy I think you can do brief psychotherapy but it it needs to be very specific yeah (laughs) and contractually contractually um, outcome no yes you are right I I am a long-term psychotherapist I think you need to know the self Uh, and actually I'll put it another way around because I was in the early 90s, 1990s, I was trained in and specialised in multiple personality disorder or the treatment of multiple personality disorder, which is a f- acute fragmentation of the self. And transaction analysis in its simplest form is a, a fragment, is concerning the fragment, fragmentation of the self into egos, as did Freud talk about. So, in fact, I think we're nearly always talking about selves rather than self. Yeah. I know we say understanding the self, 
but in reality, I think is understanding the you know the different selves we have. Yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, and we all have different nuances of, of ourselves. We've we've all got different parts. Yeah. So how how does that link in with the the topic as in techniques and you know looking at maybe two chair work? Well, let's start with two chair work, and uh, I, I've said in another podcast. I think I don't know if I said it actually in this one, but I'm going to repeat it, and that is a lot of these so-called actionistic techniques which are really aimed at helping the person understand themselves or uh, helping the person understand the conflicts with different parts of the self come from the originator of you know of psychodrama from the uh, uh, about 100 no, 1920s and then people you know people like fritz pearls and gestalt psychotherapy used two chair technique or or a lot to look at the parent child dynamic or the two parts of the cells which were lower dog and upper dog and then ta therapists um have used it a lot to look at the parent child dynamic and the conflicts of the self which get represented with the parent and child parts of the self <clears throat> so in other words instead of um simply talking to the therapist you can facilitate the client to explore different parts of the self um, by asking to talk to different parts of the self. Now, there's several reasons why that I think that is very important. Number one, you get away from a cognitive approach in psychotherapy, um, because if you just stay cognitively uh, in a cognitive dialogue or discussion with the client, then not always does that lead to where you need to go to so um you know you might ask them to talk to different parts of the self and through that process you might get to the different levels of emotion that go with the cognition secondly i think that it enables a therapist to hear the dialogue that goes on uh internally in the client's head externally manifested on the two chairs Thirdly, I've added a third one, actually, when you, you know, basically the organism, our organism is energetically focused. In other words, we're basically energy, thoughts are energy, emotion is energy. So if you get people to move from one position to another, they're moving or you're encouraging them to move from one energetic focus to another energetic focus. And that can help uh, people live out or get into these conflicts quicker than simply cognitive dialogue with the therapist and the client. Yeah. So going right back, when you're talking about two chair work, you are specifically talking about two chairs and moving from one chair to another. Correct. Yeah. It's not. Use, yeah. Some people use cushions. Yeah, I'm but gonna... just for the people listening, it, it is exactly what it says. It's the client moving from, you know, just what you were saying then about the energy shifting from one place to another. The client actually gets up and moves and sits down in another chair and gets up and sits down in another chair. Okay. Yeah. The therapist needs to be like a film director. Yes. Observing. Very... Yeah. I need to be very directive and active in the process to uh, facilitate the person to move from one chair to the other chair and back from the other chair to the other chair and help them and encourage them in the dialogue between the two parts of the self. Yeah. So for example, <clears throat> let's, pick, let's pick someone who's depressed. So what you might say to the person, okay, let's put the part of you that is depressed on this chair the part of you that perhaps used to be not depressed on the other chair. Now, they might say, I've always felt depressed. So you can say something, well, I've never actually met a baby who was born depressed. So how, put, how, about, how about put on the other chair your imagination of the younger part of yourself uh, when you weren't depressed? So there's lots of ways you could yeah. talk. But yeah. basically, 
one well, part of you that is depressed and one part of you which many years ago wasn't depressed or however you want to frame this and what does the part of you that uh, used to feel more freer and spontaneous want to say to this other part so the one part says well I was you know I, I, I had a great sense of freedom until I actually felt the world was so bleak and black and you know I just you just got to realize people were out to get me so I just so felt so awful about that okay okay so how about moving on to the other chair and reply back to that reply back to that you know and so you move on to the other chair and you say look this part of you is really uh wants to say that you know one time they felt very free but now terrible things have happened they feel bad a lot and um what have you got to say back to that so you encourage your dialogue between the two of them till you can really get to grips with the conflict yeah okay so yeah if you see <clears throat> the depressed part of the self coming out in the the mannerisms and the way that they're talking and the words that they're using you direct them to get up and move into the other chair you have two chairs yeah One. one's a depressed chair one's a not depressed chair so if there it's sat in the okay chair let's say and the words that they're using and their mannerisms are seeming depressed you direct them to get up and go and sit in the other chair yes yes yeah so i so they will move according to where their energy focuses yeah yeah because sometimes i do i do need to you know experiment and use this because sometimes I don't think the client is aware of the language and the body language that they're using. They think they are being quite positive, but actually everything that I'm seeing is quite flat. <laughs> Usually one part of the self is waiting for the other part of the self to change. Yeah. So I was always happy until X. Yeah. I was always felt free and relaxed till X. You know, until this happened in my life, I was, you know, the most happy person. And when this happened, I felt I could never continue in life. So, in, again, in, in, in TA um, language, You've got that triangle victim persecutor and rescuer they're not they're not real worlds they're psychological worlds but one but often in this two chair technique what you're going to find out that one part of them takes the hopeless helpless victim part and the other part plays another role whether it be rescuer or persecutor or whatever and but usually one person one part of the self is waiting for the other person to change in some way even if that changes is about saving them yeah like for christmas yeah now somebody who's depressed often talks about having a black cloud over them or so that you would ask them perhaps to go and play the black cat the black cloud and what would the black cloud say to the other part so you, you get to that narrative or that dialogue that goes with uh the whole process we're talking about yeah which that in itself i would imagine is quite therapeutic for a lot of people is separating that part out giving yeah. it a form if that makes sense that it isn't just part of them it can be a separate thing whether it's a black cloud or a black dog or a heavy feeling or whatever it is you can put anything on the chair mm, that's yeah. right so that, but the therapist has to be active here <clears throat> and has to be active in supporting the, in TA terms, it would be the child, again, you know, in, in often in, in relation to the parent. Uh, but in, in other terms, we might say the helpless, vulnerable part of the self in being more powerful. 
Yeah. Against the other part, which they will perceive is attacking them or putting them down. So the therapist needs to take an active stance in supporting the vulnerable self against the other. Now, uh, that's because the vulnerable self has given the power to the other part of themselves. And they feel usually so helpless and young, they aren't able to say what they really need to say to the other part of themselves because they're afraid of the consequences. Yeah. Yeah, which again is that drama triangle, victim, persecutor roles. Yeah. Now, sometimes if we're talking about a really part of the self which has been abused by another, by a, you know, abuser in some ways, and they feel so, so the vulnerable part feels so scared to even talk, to say anything back to the powerful images in their heads, then you would perhaps put the, uh, other part into a fantasy box or lock the other part up in fantasy so that the other person can have that space to say what they've never said before yeah for example. so it demands a quite a lot of creativity by the therapist yeah yeah which is is it, it it's good because being creative in the therapy room in order to facilitate change with the client is is really powerful. Uh, yeah, and it won't always work with all clients because some are quite logical and might not engage in the process. Oh, I think this is techniques that works per se with everybody. Okay. Because it isn't about, it is not. So if, for example, if we go down the place where the person says, well, <clears throat> you know um you know i can't quite know what you mean but uh if you're intellectualizes the process and says well i'm not gonna you know i can't talk to a chair or, or something like that um yeah that that actually actually that is that's where two chair talk may may not work by the way if that's what you're talking about yeah where the person actually can't imagine talking to the chair now that's an interesting one because one, it can be a defence statement because they don't want to do... But the, the other bit is, I'm highly dyspraxic and I'm also um, dyslexic, so creativity is quite high in me. But there are some people where, uh, which I was thinking of Asperger's or autism or different, where people are wired in different ways, the talking to chess becomes, you know, an absurdity or something like that. But so, there are, so you're correct. The, 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 for some people find that almost like an absurdity, then you probably have to find other ways for the person to uh, get in contact with the different conflicts of the self. Yeah. But you see, I think that's fairly rare-ish. Most people in my clinical experience have been able to talk to the different parts of the self if you encourage them. Yeah. And again, it's a gentle... Yeah. <coughs> sorry encouragement this isn't something that you throw on somebody in the you know second or third therapy no, session no no you know, this would be way down the line yes yeah they have to feel comfortable yeah yeah and you need to be trained in this yeah you can't just really, well i'll just go and put two chairs and get two people to i mean because of the level because of protection so that's a big thing i want to say on this podcast the people need to be trained in these types of uh, techniques because if you just go and well I'll go and try that that might be something magically that might work but also it it may not into and we need to think of protection of the client and um, that's a really important thing here so people need to be trained in the use of these techniques yeah I think. and yeah. if you want a psychotherapy training program you would be trained now, it doesn't mean you'll go away and use them particularly, but at least you'll be trained in how to use them. Yeah, yeah, and it was part of my training. It's just something that I've not yeah. used to do. And particularly, you know, I know I've spoke about it in the past since the pandemic, I'm still not seeing clients face to face. So it would only be online via Zoom. And I would feel very uncomfortable doing two chair work with somebody 
without being present in the room with them. Yeah, so I I I I think it's much better. <laughs> yeah, that's that this is done face to face. Yeah, yeah. Not online. Yeah, I agree with you on that because it's such a powerful technique. Yeah, yeah. So so speaking about you know it, it being a powerful technique and things like that, how would you bring a session to a close where you've done two chair work? Well, because you know yeah. talking about protection and keeping the client safe. Yeah. So again. You know, I was trained in TA and integrative psychotherapy. So, you know, I was trained in the use of this technique. Now, in transactional analysis, you've got three parts of the ego. You've got the parent part of you. You've got the adult part of you. You've got the child part of you. The parent is borrowed or assimilated from, you know, the internalized parents or significant other people, which tends to heavy, you know, gives permissions or is toxic or, and go down that later you've got the adult part of you which is in age appropriate to the here and now and then we've got the child part of you which is more aggressive and the younger self the conflicts tend to be between the parent part of the self and the younger part of the self right so though this is called a two chair technique most therapists would have three chairs I just haven't mentioned the three chairs because it's called a two chair technique. Yeah. It's called a two chair technique because it's aimed at resolving the conflict between the two parts of the self, right? But there is a third chair, which we'll put a label on, which is called adult. Yeah. So you will put a third chair in the picture. Yeah. And as you bring this to a finish, uh in a resolution of the dialogue and you might have to revisit all this again because you know the person might not have made a new decision but or they're on their way to making it yes you yeah. could ask the person to go back to the adult chair yeah in the service of grounding them so they don't go away regressed in a younger self and they don't go away being their mother or father yeah but they go away being who they are and in then you today. talk yeah. to the adult them yeah. in the adult chair and do a quick debrief yeah which i think uh, is really important when you're doing really deep yeah. therapeutic yeah yeah so in a 50 minute yeah. piece of work then you would stop after probably you wouldn't do much more than about i don't know 10 minute quarter of an hour of uh, that type of actionist of work because yeah. you'd have to have an introduction into it and you don't have to have a debrief after it so the person could go away in their adult and not in their regressed younger child or in some mother and father teacher abuser interject yeah yeah i just thought it was worth mentioning that i didn't realize you did it with yeah. the third chair but it was more about yeah. how do you bring yeah. the session yeah. to a close yeah. yeah you do it with a third chair yeah yeah even if you didn't do it with a third chair but it i would be a debrief is that they do um you would uh well i would always ask them to go to an adult place yeah so i would always ask them to move to another cushion or something to and make sure they were the age they are and do a debrief yeah. before i ask them to leave yeah i quite like the idea of having that third chair i think that's good yeah definitely and yeah. and the other thing i would say is that very rarely does the new decision because that's where you're heading in terms of healing yeah that there's an empowerment and a new decision made very rarely does that happen in one session you have yes. to usually go back many times and revisit that process again so that the new decision is integrated um into the adult let's put it that way so they can have new coping mechanisms and behaviors which are more healthy than the outdated ones they had before, which wasn't so healthy. Yeah. Now we're talking about quite sophisticated nuances of therapy here. Yeah. By the way, I wanted to say that yeah, as yeah. I realized as we're talking, people are listening to this. Uh, I'm sure if they're therapists, this is quite familiar to them, but people perhaps aren't, or even training in psychotherapy, I do want to say this is advanced methods if you like this isn't something you just go away and do no you learn usually in the fourth year or third year of training and you will have to become practiced in it 
yeah yeah i like i said i i've not used the two chair work in the therapy but i have i have used something i don't know whether it's it's scaled down but we when you were talking then about energy i have got a client to get up and move when they've been overwhelmed in a session when they've you know felt stuck and overwhelmed and there's just a lot of emotion I have actually got them to physically stand up and move into another chair to get a different feel and to ground them see that would be a technique yeah, well I, I do that quite regular <laughs> so that's yeah. a technique which might come from your transactionalysis training Definitely. where they can yeah. themselves as more adults or ground themselves yeah yeah I think that's why when you said there's always that adult chair in the work i think that's why I, I kind of honed in on that because that's how i see the grounding within a session is to go to a more neutral adult place yeah oh yes that needs to be the caveat for all psychotherapy training that they always have the psychotherapist always has a duty of care to yeah. find and it's, it's really really important that the person isn't grounded in the adult before they leave the room yeah I mean, it's almost at the level of a, 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 an ethical uh, standpoint that there's a duty of care and the protection comes first and being an adult comes first. Yeah. Even if a person feels young, you need to do a debrief so that you can check out that they are in the here and now and are functioning at the age that they are. Yeah. Because it is really powerful stuff that happens behind closed doors in the therapy room, Bob. <laughs> Certainly this type of work. And if yeah. we're going to other techniques, I'd like to talk about some techniques, which I'm sure you do all the time, but I'll call it a technique, and that's giving permissions. And number one, and secondly, giving strokes mm -hmm. too. Now yeah. their techniques. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sure you give permissions a lot, though, you not? Yes, all the time, yeah. <clears throat> so their techniques, yeah, because they are aimed uh, I hope, at enhancing health in some way with your clients, giving them permissions to, you know, be themselves, giving them permissions to enjoy themselves, being given permissions to have feelings, giving permissions to think and feel at the same time. Whichever permissions you give, you could call them techniques because they will be said at a particular time in therapy and they will be developmental and there will be a um, well thought out reason why you're giving them. Yeah. In other words, it's clinical. It's not just, oh, I'll give a permission, you know. No, I, I sometimes use permissions in a challenging way. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it's clinically thought out. Oh, isn't yes, it? definitely. But it's, yeah, right. totally intentional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's the same with strokes. Now, strokes might be, you know, a unit of social recognition. In other words, it, 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 it's positive and there's negative use of recognition. But what I'm talking about is positive strokes, where you are stroking people. You might you might want to see this and uh, recognize them if you want. Yeah. Or or for things they do well, so they get some sense of uh, accounting for themselves, and and you're helping then helping clients being able to change their narratives in their head to a kinder, uh, more positive narrative, rather than perhaps the toxic one they've taken on board from their significant person, which actually doesn't help. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's, now that is another, there's another technique. Yeah. But they're all techniques that hopefully you've learned in training and also you know, are clinically thought out in terms of when you give them and how come you are giving them. Yes, yeah. Now, we, and just a couple of other techniques because, you know, we're on the subject of techniques, there's many of them. You know, dream workers, fantasy workers, how we're accessing the child ego state, how all these different ways of doing it. They can be called, called techniques, but they all need to be clinically thought out and in the service of the client. I like that phrase. I was trying to think of that. Yes, these techniques are brilliant, but it is, I was going to say for the good of the client, but what you said then is, is even better, yeah. And, and we also need to think about 
that people may defend against them in many different ways and that's okay and you can keep on saying them and doing them because eventually you might get around their defenses but you know it also gives you the opportunity as a therapist to explore the defense yes yeah so i understand that you think that i might be tricking you when i say that to you and where do you think that might have come from in your history so it's a way of exploring the survival mechanisms yeah and okay i i just love my job bob i really do but sometimes when you give permissions or you know to say certain things in a session you can see a physical change on the client oh yeah the defense mechanism if you say something positive or kind or night whatever it is that there's a sometimes there's a stiffening to it there's a reaction that that goes on that you physically see yeah it's really powerful stuff yes and uh, and they're important it's important what we're talking about here because it's yeah. the bread and butter. It's the bread and butter of a professional psychotherapist. Yeah. We will learn not only the theory in training, but we'll, in a decent training program, have the uh, time and space to practice what we're talking about. Yeah. Can I put a request in for the next episode, Bob? What's, what's the request? You touched on it and I'm fascinated. You said something about dream work and was it fantasy work? Yeah, dream work and fantasy work. I mean, it's very, very important for, for therapists, I think, to, especially around fantasy work, um, to work with the dreams and fantasies of the younger self in psychotherapy. I would love to do those as topics. Fine, we'll put them on the list. On the list, as in that can be the next episode, dream work. The next episode, if you like. Um, but, but you know, we've got a list of about 30 or 40 topics, haven't we? We have, we've got lots. And I think I dream, work is, I, dream work is on it. Dream work is I just want to show you it off a bit. Yeah, you can put them wherever you want to put them. Well, that's, I, that's going to be the next one then. Okay, yeah. yeah. Now, of course, just to the podcast listeners, um, Freud, well, Freud was probably the first dream, th dream analyst or dream therapist of our times. And he wrote avidly about the analysis of dreams. So the analysis of dreams goes back a long way. So Freud, probably up to young, uh, a lot of the well-known psychoanalysts uh, all did dream anal analysis. Gestalt psychotherapy, very well known from dream analysis. So this isn't just a modern day occurrence. It's dream analysis has a huge heritage. I'm really interested in knowing more about that, Bob. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many therapists uh, actually are trained in analysis and the analyzing of dreams. Um, I was trained well, I say train, I don't know how many workshops I did, uh, from a Gestalt program I did, but where, 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 where you can analyse dreams in a specific way. And I do know a little bit about how you, you know, analyse dreams from a psychoanalytical perspective, and also a little bit from a TA perspective. So I can talk about different perspectives of dream analysis. Well, but it's all in the child ego state. That's been well, bumped up the list. Yeah, but what gets even it more interesting is, it, oh, I, I think if I keep talking, we'll yes. be here for ages. Yes, don't. That's the next episode. <laughs> listen. So if anybody's listening That's and is interested episode, to know then. more. The next episode then, okay. The next episode. So thank you so much, Bob. Um, as always, I've learned so much from being part of these and I shall speak to you on the next episode. You will speak to me on the next episode. Uh, you can only dream about that, of course. <laughs> I, I, you, you will be in my fantasy yeah, between now and then, Bob. <laughs> no, but we'll turn your dreams into a reality. Thank you so much. Speak soon. Yes, yeah, speak soon. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week 
with another episode.